I have, a, I have a title this morning, sermon, Opened Heart Surgery. Opened Heart Surgery. Please, so. Uh, I will point you to two letters. Two letters, Mr. Carlos, and that's the ED oh. on the end. It's a play on words, amen? Open heart surgery, amen? Please stand for the reading of the word. I'm in Luke chapter 14, verse 1 through 6. One Sabbath, when he went to dine at the house of a ruler of the Pharisees, they were watching him carefully. And behold, there was a man before him who had dropsy. And Jesus responded to the lawyers and Pharisees, saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? But they remained silent. Then he took him and healed him. And sent him away. And he said to them, Which of you, having a son or an ox that has fallen into a well on a Sabbath day, will not immediately pull him out? And they could not reply to him about these things. Please be seated. Before we uh, go into this portion of scripture, I, I, I don't know if it's the first time I've ever seen it. Or if it was a revelation, I shared this with the elders on Wednesday. But as I was studying through this portion of scripture, in chapter 14, he goes to this Pharisee's house. And, and if you read, continue to read, you, you see no transition until you hit chapter 17, verse 10. And the reason I say that is because from that point on, from this moment on, there's a whole lineage of teaching that Jesus does. And I'm a firm believer that it was all sitting at the table. And it all revolved around this right here, the heart. So I, I know I've been preaching through the book of Luke, but I, I'm seeing this right now as, a, as a, 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 a series within a series of sermons, all related to the heart. Okay, so I'm going to lay that groundwork out because over the next several weeks, however long the Lord lets me tarry in Luke, because um, we've been here for a while now, but, but it's been a good study, amen? It's been good stuff, but... In this portion of scripture about the heart. So I wonder as we sit here this morning. What, what would it be like if you and I. Could ask Jesus to lunch. If you could ask him to lunch. Hey man. But it, I, and I, I'm not, I don't doubt that. That Jesus is here Ken. That's not what I'm saying. But imagine what it would be like. To actually have him here. And sit across the table from you. Just to ask him to lunch. Go to lunch. Where, where you could talk to him and he to you on a one-on-one -on -one basis that way. I wonder what he would say to us. I wonder what he would say to you. I have an idea that the conversation would not revolve around all of our questions to him, but would rather be directed to our hearts and what is really deep inside each of us. The reason I say that is because of this portion of Scripture. Because Jesus is sitting at the table with a bunch of Pharisees and Sadducees. And the greater picture is as you look through it, it's not, just, it's not just the Pharisees and the Sadducees that are there. Because later on you'll see that there's a whole flock of people that are right there listening to every word that's being spoken. See, I don't think we really capture the intensity of the moment as we read those words. When Jesus comes to dine at the synagogue ruler's house, we don't really capture the intensity of the moment. He and all his buddies, right? I'm talking about the synagogue ruler and the Pharisees. They're all sitting there. And everyone else who's flocked just to hear and see the Lord and all that he's doing. In, in the Greek, the moment is on edge. It's on edge. And the reason I say that is because the Pharisees, if you look in the Greek text, it's an amazing thing because the intent that they brought him there to sit down at table with him was not so he could eat. The intent there is sinister. They're, they're sinister. In their hearts, they have pre-planned what they're going to do. And they're looking for anything and everything that they can use against Jesus in order to bring him to trial, in order to kill him and remove him from the community. That's their plan. That's what's going on deep in their hearts. And that's why I was wondering this morning, as our sister shared that word and Jim read the 23rd Psalm this morning, about the anointing that rests upon us. When we go before our very enemy, and Jesus is sitting at the table with his enemies. And God's anointing is upon him. The Holy Spirit is upon him. Why? 
because he's dining right in the midst of them all. And if we look deep enough, we'll see not only that, but Jesus is literally feeding them if they'll listen to the truth. They're watching him closely. The Greek there, when you look at the words watching him closely, that's where you get that. With sinister intent, they have sinister intent. It is he who poses the first question. Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? But they don't see what he sees. There is a need of open heart surgery at the table, and they are unaware of it. But the Lord knows. Sitting at the very table with the Lord is a man who has dropsy. You know what dropsy is? That's, no, no. I was, I was amazed at this, right? When I looked it up, I was, I was amazed. It's not, it's not an epileptic thing. Dropsy is a collection of fluid in your extremities. Why does it collect there? You've got heart issues. you got heart So, So I want you to imagine this. One of Jesus' enemies is sitting across the table from him, and he asks the question of them all sitting there with everyone else listening, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? And the guy who's sitting across the table from him doesn't even understand what's wrong with him, and that he's the one who needs what? He's got a heart issue. He's got a heart issue, and Jesus sees it. And his enemy's sitting across the table from him. Imagine that. Imagine that picture. Here he is. He sees this guy's need. And he's speaking to who? His enemies. And Jesus sees a need for healing. Not only on a physical level, but on a spiritual level too. They're unaware of it. But the Lord knows. The Lord knows. They are there with evil intent. And Jesus is there to minister, even to them who would do him harm. There is a deeper need at the table, because their hearts are not right, and yet he loves them. Their hearts are not right, and yet he he loves them. Look at the scripture. Luke 6, 45. The good person, out of the good treasure of his heart, produces good. And the evil person, out of the evil treasure, produces evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaks. Now you got to get a hold of that scripture for a moment. Because who's speaking right now? Jesus is speaking. And what is flowing out of him? It's coming right out of his heart to these people. Sometimes I think, folks, that we we look at the scriptures and we look at the the conflict between him and the Pharisees. And we, we think that somehow or another that Jesus is on the offense. Oh, get him. Go get him. Get them, Jesus. Get them. Because they're, 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 they're Pharisees and Sadducees. They don't deserve to be where? <gasps> oh, Lord, forbid you to even begin to think that. But he loves them and he's trying to tell them. Yeah. I heard Michael W. Smith this morning. I was coming in. He was talking about how he wanted to get to the point in his life, but there was, there was no disdain, there was no judgment in his heart against anyone. He wants to get to that point. Why? Who's on, who's on your most wanted list in your life, right? It should be everyone. Everyone. Even the worst of the worst. Raise your hand. The worst of the worst. Yeah, you're right. You're the worst of the worst. I know it. Jesus knows it. Look, without salvation, there's no hope at all. Jesus doesn't have ill intent towards the Pharisees and Sadducees. He's merely challenging them in their minds and their hearts of what's real and what's true and what's right. And he's trying to promote in them and deliver to them what? The very word of life. In order for them to turn. They are his people, you know. He does love them. He does care. And I know that you do too, amen? I can imagine this individual knew something was wrong with himself physically. Maybe he had this sense of how he just wasn't feeling good. He, he progressively had been feeling worse, and his legs were killing him. I, I think about this. I think about my brother-in-law, Stuart. You can see Stuart. If you've ever seen him in shorts, you can tell his legs are just absolutely swollen. And they're, they're, I, I know they're discolored, but that's, that's from another problem. But he's got, he's got, there's a larger issue going on with him and his body, right? And the, the fluids, as they collect in your body down there, it begins to create pain. It's painful to even walk. I mean, I was joking the other day, because you know, I turned 53, and I, don't stone me. Don't stone me. 
I'm just a puppy. And we were joking around right? because I was talking to some. He goes, do you feel older? I said, well, when we get up in the morning, we feel like gorillas just trying to get started, you know? <laughs> just try to get started. Get your legs going and everything, you know? And uh, as, as life moves on and as we get older, you know, things just don't work the way that they used to. And Miss June's fixing to say, you think? <laughs> so I, I just think about this in relation to this guy, you know, as he sits at the table with Jesus. Everyone, they see what's going on. They see, the, they see the symptoms, okay? They see the symptoms. And so many times we want to, we as Christians, we want to treat symptoms. Jesus isn't about treating symptoms. He doesn't treat symptoms. He goes to the cause, doesn't he? He goes to the root of the issue of what's really going on. And I, to, me, to me, that's just paramount in my Christian experience in my life to understand that. That the Lord isn't going to deal with your peripherals. He's going to deal with the real issue in your life. And you can, we as people, as we as Christians continue to walk away from it, or we can embrace what God's trying to deal with us and move us into that right relationship and what he wants in us and the truth of it if we will listen. Because there's Pharisees and Sadducees sitting at the table. And Jesus is desperately trying to minister to them the truth and to give them the word of life so that they will turn and be what? His people. His people. As Jesus looks into their eyes, and peers much deeper into their hearts. He knows they are all in need of some serious heart surgery. One of them on two levels. Because not only does he need a physical touch from the Lord. But a spiritual one too. There are many in the world today. Who are in deep need of some serious heart surgery. And they don't even know. It. What we see is everything is out of control with them. And their lives spiral further and further away from the Lord. We call that symptoms. You cannot treat symptoms and hope to deal with the real issue. The real issue is much deeper within. And quite frankly, is a heart issue. There's something wrong in their heart. If you see their lives spinning out of control, and things just ain't going right for them, nothing seems to be right, there's something deeper going on. There's something deeper going on. And Jesus is the only one who can step in and touch the heart and make it right. Amen? You can see the destruction of their life and the turmoil when they go through it with those who are not right with God because everything in front of them and everything behind them is full of destruction. Like a hurricane cuts a swath in its own path. Not to, not to play on that because we had real hurricanes coming through like Right? What happens? You ever been through one? You ever been through a typhoon or hurricane? You have, Mr. Bob? Yes. Tornado? That's 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 bad. Go ahead. You? Ah. St. Helens. St. Helens? But I can tell you the, the worst uh, the worst typhoon I've ever been through was Pamela in 1977. My dad was stationed in Guam, and uh, we were there. I will never ever 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 forget that. We went into the house, and we were in the house for three days straight. And uh, the winds were in excess of 200 mile an hour. And we were living, I, I will never forget, I was, I was, we had, a, there were louvers like, like those, but except for they go the other way, right? The, the blinds there, they, they don't go this way, they went this way. And there was a handle on it, you could pull it and look outside. And I will never forget, me and my dad and my brother were laying on my bed, and we were betting on when coconut trees would disappear. And... Uh, there was a, a shed that was right outside of our house that, I, I'm telling you, three full-grown men could not move it. And a wind hit that thing and pushed it. And I remember, because it went right past the window as we were looking outside, it went right past the window. And, and it hit the, the neighbor's house. And I will never forget this. My dad said, oh, good, it'll be safe now. And then another wind hit it. And I, I'll tell you, I, the lawnmower never touched the ground. That, that shed just it completely exploded, and I saw the, wind, the, 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 the lawnmower just tumble down. So my brother and my dad, they leave the room, and of course I stayed in my bed. I was looking, and I closed. I had closed the louvers, and I had just opened those things up, and my dad had opened up the door to my bedroom, and the change in pressure ripped that window right out of the wall, <laughs> and I, I had still had the handle in my hand, and it, I'm telling you, it's outside. It's just it's going everywhere, 
everywhere. And my dad's like, let it go, let it go. And I, I, I refused. I pulled that thing back in somehow or another. We got a hold of it. Dad hammered it into the wall and got it, got it secure again. And as soon as it was secure, I, he dropped the hammer and, and, and beat me. <laughs> <laughs> He spanked me. I'm like, Dad. He goes, I told you to let it go. And when I said let it go, I mean let it go. Look, there's a lesson in that. Hear me. When the Father tells you to let go of something, let it go. Let it go. We, we want to hold on to things. We want to hold on to things in the past. And he's so desperately trying to get us focused on our future and what he has for us. Amen? And the heart of God wants to move you. From where you're at to where he's at and where he's going and what he wants and what he desires. And the desperation to try and communicate that to your friends, to your family's lives, who is spinning out of control. And it's like you're in a hurricane and you're just waiting for the next disaster to come up. Why? Because there's heart issues going on. It's a heart issue. It's a heart issue. As a Christian, it's a wonderment to look at Life like you are in the eye of a hurricane. Everything around you spinning out of control in the world you live in. But you rest easily in the center of salvation and the peace that God so easily gives. Do you understand that? You see their life is spinning out of control because there's something wrong with them, right? You happen to live in a world that's spinning out of control and yet everything's okay. <laughs> there's a difference. When your perspective is right. And your life is right with God. And you're living for him. And it is. It seems that way. The world is spinning out of control, and yet everything seems to be okay. Why? Because you're secure. You're literally moving this hurricane, and you're in the eye of the storm permanently. Because God has you in his palm of his hand. God has your life. God is leading you and guiding you. God is moving you, and he's your peace. He will guide you and protect you. One causing the issues, the other existing within them. With a heart to touch it and to heal the chaos. It is a serious heart issue. And only Jesus, only Jesus can heal it and touch it. Jesus asked the question, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? As he looks into the eyes of this man who knows something isn't right within himself. In the very same moment as Jesus speaks to the hearts of everyone in the room. I get, you got no idea what Jesus is about to do as he rises from the table and reaches across and lays his hands on him and immediately this man says, I, I want you to get a hold of that mind picture. Because this man is sitting across the table from him, doesn't even, he knows something ain't right in him. He, he knows and he's one of the crew. Let's put it that way. He's one of the pharisaical crew. And he thinks he's got it all figured out. He's got what? He's got evil intent towards Jesus. And Jesus sees the real need. And I want you to imagine this moment as Jesus is sitting at a table and he asks the question again, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? And they refuse. And he gets up from the table and he grabs a hold of this guy and the guy's got him up and immediately, bam, he senses it. Immediately he knows something's changed in him. Something's right in him. Something's healed in him. And he feels it. And all of a sudden his legs ain't hurt no more. All of a sudden, the dropsy is completely gone, and, and Jesus hasn't dealt with the dropsy as much as he's dealt with the what? The heart issue. And what's he do? Does he leave, let him stay there? No. You know what he does? He heals him and then sends him away. I look at that. You look at that as a Christian. When the Lord comes in and he brings healing to your life, he sends you away, doesn't he? You start a whole new life, don't you? Everything's brand new for you. You no longer have to hold on to the things of the past. We were discussing this this morning. Because I, as human beings, we have this tendency, right? I, I, I enjoy the forgiveness that God gives to me, don't you? I love it. To, to know I'm born again, to know that I'm saved. So why am I holding on to things of the past? Why, why am I holding these tethers of unforgiveness to people in my life? Why? God gives me this forgiveness. His expectation is that is a clean moment. That guy is dead. This guy is born again, brand new. 
You are born again. You have a brand new life. You're a brand new person. Let it go. Let it go. The things that are binding you, the things that you're holding tethers to, give it to God. Just say, you know what? That's not who I am anymore. This is who I am. See, Satan always wants to remind you of your what? Of your past. I want to encourage you. When he does that, immediately do this. Don't run from it. Don't run from it. Do this immediately. As soon as he reminds you of something in your past that you used to be, that you ain't anymore, number one, remember who you are. And number two, just for the sake of it, say this, Lord God, forgive me for that. And guess what? He's got nothing left on you. Are there people in your past? Are there people, is there things in your past that you're holding on to? Let them go. It will free you to be who you want. That's some serious heart surgery, isn't it? This man knows inside himself his legs no longer hurt. And he hasn't felt this good in a long, long time. He doesn't speak a word as Jesus sends him away. But everyone in the room notices his legs aren't swollen anymore. But what they can't see is the change of heart. What they can't see is the healing that's happened in the heart. And that's where it all begins. That's where it begins for every one of us, amen? We come to Christ, the first thing He's going to deal with is everything inside of you. He cleanses the cup from where? From the inside first. He cleans you inside. He gets your heart right. He gets your mind right. He gets everything right about you. And then what happens? All of a sudden, things change for you. And out of, out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. He begins to change you. He begins to change your way of thinking, your understanding. And He moves you into what He wants and what He desires. See, Jesus always heals the real issues at hand. For the issues of life are a product of what is deep in your heart. The surgeon is in. He never sleeps. He never takes a day off. Especially with the, those that he loves and that he need healing that only he can give and that only he can see. From this moment on, from chapter 17, all the way up to chapter 17, verse 10, Jesus is dealing with the heart issues in the room. And we're going to go through these and take a look at them over the next few weeks. I want you to be prepared for that. If you want to continue reading in Luke, read all the way up to 1710 because that's where I'm going to be. At least that's where I feel the Lord wants me to be. Jesus deals with the hearts of everyone in, in the room in the hope of bringing the healing they all need and which only he can give. And as you sit at table with him right now, I wonder what he sees. Know this. He wants to heal you. And open heart surgery is at the top of his list. Look at this. Listen to the scripture. 2 Corinthians 6, 1 through 13. Working together with him, then, we appeal to you not to receive the grace of God in vain. For he says, in the favorable time, I listened to you. And in the day of salvation, I helped you. Behold, now is the favorable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. We put no obstacle in anyone's way, so that no fault may be found with our ministry. You hear the heart of Jesus? Doesn't matter who you're with, does it? He wants to reach out and minister. But as servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way, by great endurance and afflictions, hardships, calamities, Beatings, imprisonments, riots, labors, sleepless nights, hunger. By purity, knowledge, patience, kindness, the Holy Spirit, and genuine love. By truthful speech and the power of God with the weapons of righteousness for the right hand and for the left. Through honor and dishonor, through slander and praise, we are treated as impostors, as unknown and yet well known. As dying and behold, we live. As punished and yet not killed. As sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. As poor, yet making many rich. As having nothing, yet possessing everything. We have spoken freely to you, Corinthians. Our heart is wide open. You are re not restricted by us, but you are restricted in your own affections. In return, I speak to you as children. Widen your hearts also. Do you hear the appeal? Do you hear the appeal of Paul? Do you hear the appeal of Paul to the Corinthian church? Hey, we've opened our hearts wide to you. You know why? Because God's heart is always 
wide open to anyone and everyone. Who is it that causes our hearts to be closed? Yes, and I think sometimes desire for other things. Desire for other things. So I want to encourage you this morning. Open your hearts wide to the Lord and what he has in store for you. Amen. All that he's given to you, all that he's provided. He will reach in and minister in places that no one else can see. And no hearts that no other person can touch. Because he sees you holy and everything that you are. Amen. You encouraged this morning? Any other scriptures? Any other thoughts? You can't always. Thank you. Go ahead. You can't always explain what it does in your heart. We're trying to get. We're trying to figure it out with our mind, and that's not where it is. Amen. All I know, Lord, is that change comes. My my way of thinking, my understanding changes from what the world wants to instill in me and it leads me into what God wants for me and the desires that He wants. And this pursuit of His presence and, and wanting to be close to Him, right? To understand His heart, to know Him. And uh, if you, that, that scripture in, uh, where is it? We, we studied it this morning. It's, it's in uh, Philippians chapter 3, verses 7 through, I don't know, 14. Um. You look at that scripture and Paul's desire to be close to the Lord and wanted to know him in every aspect of his life and his death and his burial and his resurrection. It's good stuff. Carly Trout came to know. I'm sure you know that I was joking there, but I'm a firm believer that uh, if it wasn't for God with that open heart surgery I had, I wouldn't be here today. Amen. It's all in the same. Amen. I mean, I mean, who would you who would you rather do surgery on you on the inside? Someone don't know what they're doing. I want the be- I want the best doctor there is. Amen. I want the person that can really know what they're doing to get it right the first time. Amen. We need that. I need that in my life. I need to open my heart to God and ask Him to bring healing to me. Maybe there's things that I don't even see. Amen. There's things that that are in you that. I can't see, but you know what? You know that it's there, and so does Jesus. And he wants to touch it. Let him. Don't make him get up from the table and come grab a hold of you, amen? <laughs> but even in that, amen. <laughs> even in that. I would, you know, thinking about this, what it's going to be like. I shared this again this morning, but I'll share it again. What is it going to be like when you, when you transition from this world to the next? And your, your spirit, your spirit comes out of your body. And as soon as that happens, the light goes on. And you know what you're going to be thinking? Everything Jesus ever said was true. And then when he escorts you home, he escorts you home. And you, you're walking through the gate. And the moment you walk through the gate, you realize again that everything that Jesus ever said was absolutely true. true. And the reality sets in. There's only one thing that any of us are going to be able to do when we walk into heaven. Because the the realization is going to come in you, and there's only one thing you're going to be able to do. You know what it is? Hallelujah! Praise you, God! We worship you! I honor you! I lift you up! I exalt you, O God! Thank you! That's, a, that's all you're going to be able to do. That's all you're ever going to be able to do is to worship him and to honor him and to thank him and to glorify him and magnify him in your life. Amen. And that's the desire of Jesus for every human soul. Amen? Amen. Most gracious and heavenly Father, we worship you this morning. We're so grateful to you for all that you do and all that you provide. And Father, we long for the moment when your trumpet will sound. And that we will truly be home with you forever and ever and ever. But God, in this moment, we are still here. And you still have us as vessels, Lord, in this world, in this place, to draw people to you. To reach out, to touch, to minister your message to hearts. Lord, touch them in ways that we never can. Minister to them by your spirit. Open their hearts, O God, to see you. 
and to taste you and to see that you truly are good and that you love them, Father. You love them beyond all measure, enough to go to the cross for them. It's in Christ's name we pray. And everybody said? Amen. Amen. You sing one more song? I know I ask you that every week, but I'm conditioned. and minds, O oh Father. Reach in and touch their hearts. Open their hearts to see you, O oh God. Open us to see you, O oh Lord. Allow us to let you in, Father, to touch the he- and heal those things that only you can see and that only you can bring the healing, Father, that we need. We just ask you for this, O oh God. Give to us divine opportunities, Lord, to share your message. Open our hearts to our enemies, even as your son sat at table with his own, simply to feed them as they thought they were feeding him and to take his life from him, as he gives life to them, O oh God. We pray, O oh Father, help us to be of the same mindset, of the same heart. Help us, O oh God, we pray. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, Amen. Hey, hug somebody, would you?